Welcome once again, congregation, to our sermon for this Lord's Day. We are going to be looking at Christianity Sermon Number 8, The Christian Church and State. But before we do so, let's come to God our Heavenly Father in prayer. Let us pray. O Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the grace that is in Thy Son, the Lord Jesus, who with Thee and the Holy Ghost are ever worshipped one God. And we pray, O Lord, for thy blessing this morning on the service and on the sermon, that we, thy servants, may be edified thereby to live thy faith before the world and in this country of ours. We ask thee, O Lord, despite our sins, to bless our country and to restore our faith to thee. For we ask these things with a blessing both on the sermon and the hearers. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm reading, as is my wont, from the New King James Version of the Holy Bible, and from the first epistle or letter of the Apostle Peter, and chapter 2, to verse, and including verse 8. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Coming to him, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offence. They stumble, being disobedient to the word, to which they also were appointed. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his most holy, infallible, and inspired word. The subject for this morning's talk is Christianity Sermon 8, The Christian Church and State. We've been going through the history of Christianity in Britain. But we've had to divert, and we'll have to continue this diversion for quite a while, to developments on the continent. It's a thematic approach which I'm adopting, a thematic primarily, but also it's interspersed with chronology. But we're having to flit back and forth somewhat between the centuries. And I just thought you should bear that in mind so that we don't get too confused. Last time we began to look at the development of the churches. They're coming together, firstly, into smaller and then into larger areas, as by dioceses and then provinces. And then we began to look at the formation of the patriarchates, four in the east and one in the west, as a response to the needs of the provincial churches themselves, especially their growing power and influence, and as an answer in particular to the growing chaos in the west, upon the collapse of the imperial power in the city of Rome. The apostles had not left the churches with any universal or uniform structure apart from local entities that often met in larger private houses or in the woods or in the catacombs. Many of the early Christians had been slaves or of low social status and were not able to do much else than be a part of a kind of clandestine organisation which was barely very well organised. Therefore, to hold explicit office in a non-recognised or even forbidden organisation would involve for them grave risk to themselves, or at the very best, misunderstanding. Some of the churches had barely any organisation at all. The process of creating and empowering pastors and then diocesan bishops and then provincial metropolitans or archbishops was a process that began from the bottom up and not from the top down and took about four to five centuries to complete. 
In the eastern part of the Roman Empire, this process of bottom-up centralisation and standardisation was hindered, and to a degree stayed, both by the continued presence of the East Roman or Byzantine emperor, and by the rivalry of the several patriarchates that existed in the east, Jerusalem, Antioch, Constantinople and Alexandria. There were also some ecclesiastically and politically strong metropolitans, such as at Ephesus. In the West, however, there was only one patriarchate, the Metropolitical and Darsosan Bishop of Rome. And there was no longer there in the West, after 476 AD, an emperor to keep this patriarch in check, as there was at Constantinople. Moreover, the chaos of the times needed a figurehead who could provide a focus for order and stability, not just for the growing churches, but also for the fragmenting society and disintegrating civilization. It is said that Claudius was made emperor because the Praetorian Guard needed someone to employ them after the murder of Caligula. Likewise, the situation in the West needed someone like a political and ecclesiastical emperor. And that is part of the reason for the emergence of what we have already alluded to as the Patriarch of the West. This process of establishing what became known as the papacy was furthered by two facts to which we have already alluded, namely the donation of Constantine and the Petrine Doctrine. In the first, the donation of Constantine, it was averred that the Christian emperor Constantine the Great or Constantine I had donated the whole of the western part of the Roman Empire to the Bishop of Rome and to his successors in title. The Bishop of Rome was thus, in a sense, the successor of the Roman emperors, in the West at least, though not in the East. In the second doctrine, the doctrine of the supremacy of Peter, it was alleged that the Church had been uniform and organisationally complete and united at the beginning, that Christ had made Peter the universal bishop or head of his whole Church in his absence and as his vicar or substitute and viceroy, and that the office of Christ as king, king of the nations as well as of the church, had fallen to Christ's earthly substitute, Peter, and to Peter's successors who were, like him, it was alleged, bishops of the church in the imperial and eternal city of Rome. The bishops of Rome were thus also, it was claimed, the successors of Peter, not just the Roman emperors the alleged viceroy or vicar of Christ on earth himself. These two beliefs, the donation of Constantine and the primacy of Peter, or the alleged primacy of Peter, were powerfully held and promoted in some quarters, and both of these beliefs helped propel the mono-patriarch of the West, for that is what he was, to new heights of prestige, if not yet of power, in order to at least bring some standardization and stability out of diversity and chaos in both state and church in the disintegrating end stage of the Roman Empire. There was something to be said for this, for those who saw a world in chaos. What better than a substitute and successor for both Emperor and Christ the King to bring unity, a kind of divine-like figurehead, or even real head, to hold sway over faith, morals, church, and barbarian kingdoms, the concept of Christendom, the Western version of it, was thus born and promoted in a new sense. It was not, of course, quite as simple as this. The Pope, as we may now call him, the Bishop of Rome, the Patriarch of the West, was still a Christian bishop. He still had his pastoral office. He could not intrude too clearly or too early on into the affairs of the state and of this world. But, by and by, the Patriarch of the West began, as an office or institution, to collide with both the churches and patriarchs of the East, who regarded him as an upstart, a fraud, an impostor, and even as an antichrist. The donation of Constantine was a fraud, certainly. The Petrine doctrine was unheard of in the East, and in the early church. The early church had never been uniform or organisationally united in the way that the Petrine doctrine anachronistically assumed, and an earlier bishop of Rome from the 7th century had claimed that anyone alleging himself to be world bishop was the Antichrist, or man of sin, 
who, in the temple of God, the church, sits as God, to be worshipped, as Paul prophesied, in 2 Thessalonians and chapter 2 and verses 3 to 4. The word anti is a Greek word which means instead of as well as opposed to. In claiming to be instead of Christ, his purported vicar or substitute was in fact making an impersonation of Christ, an imposture which amounted to usurpation, and was therefore hostile to Christ under colour or pretence of legitimacy. For God will not give his glory to another. Have a look at Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8, Isaiah chapter 45 and verses 5 to 6. These were serious charges, but the first bishop to claim this primacy of universal bishop had not been the bishop of Rome, but rather the bishop of Constantinople. It would be a mistake to think that the problem was simply or even mainly with the church see and bishopric of Rome, as some extreme commentators have done. No. The problem of competing powers and of the relationship between the secular and religious authorities was one that affected and arose in all parts of the Western medieval world, as well as in the East, in Byzantium. The Bishop of Rome was certainly the source of some of the problems in the distorted Petrine doctrine already adverted to, and in the alleged donation of Constantine, which was indeed fraudulent. But in other respects the Sea of Rome's power grab was a symptom of wider issues, and devolving prestige or power up to it was often seen as a practical solution to these wider issues. What are, for example, the precise limits of the several churches' legal power? and of those of the kings or secular barons, now that rulers were Christians, and members of the church, and were presumably, like any other members, subject to the censure of the church and of its bishops, not just the metropolitical bishops, but also the diocesan ones, and subject also to the abbots of the monasteries, the monasteries being a kind of parachurch organisation parallel to the churches. The churches and the monasteries became both great property holders, barons in other words, and had the tremendous prestige not only of ownership but also of spiritual power, as it was believed that they held the way and the keys to the kingdom of heaven as much for the dead in purgatory as for the living and baptized. A struggle was bound to ensue between the princes, the Christian princes of this world, and those who, it was believed, held the keys to the next, and this was the case for much of the medieval period, and was as true of the Byzantine Empire as of the kingdoms in the West, although the Byzantine solution was very different to that of the Western one. But there was also another conflict, namely between the Catholic bishops themselves, as they had accrued power from below, or as it had been given to them from above by kings, and the monopatriarch of the West, the emerging Pope. These relationships were often tenuous and not very stable. It was good and wise to get decisions made by consent of the folks who mattered. The local princes and rulers or barons, the king himself, the abbots of monasteries or the chapters of cathedrals, the person who had the rights of presentation or provision to a freehold or to a bishopric, often the diocesan or metropolitan, and, of course, the Pope himself. Above him would be the general councils, at least of the churches in the West, a breach with the churches of the East, known as the Great Schism, having occurred in the mid-eleventh century. One important date which might well have helped the prevention of an absolutist papal monarchy emerging over the Catholic churches of the West was in 800 AD, when the Roman Empire in the West was apparently restored by the proclamation of Charlemagne as Holy Roman Emperor. But the empire and its civilization had gone, and the Holy Roman Emperor lacked the power and the structures necessary to make the declared restoration of it a reality. Soon after, Charlemagne's death, his empire split back into France and Germany and in both of these areas power was regionalised or decentralised, a Europe of the regions, if you like. 
so that the national kings of France and the Kaisers of medieval Germany could not muster enough force against their own feudatories, let alone against anyone else. And many of their feudal underlings were not only dukes but bishops. All was not looking well for the Catholic kings or emperors among the Catholic or provincial churches, and then above them all, in image or belief, or even in perceived reality, was God's vicar and viceroy as the Petrine theory proclaimed him. How the earth could now be made to tremble by him at least in theory and belief, if not altogether in practice. The alleged donation of the western part of the Roman Empire to the bishops of Rome did much to bolster their prestige and help in the devolution upwards to them of the reality of church power which had from the first been dispersed to the local level. But the distorted Petrine doctrine did equally as much. Christ had not given authority to any one person in the church. To claim so was a mark of the man of sin. When Christ had said to Peter that he was a rock or stone, and that upon this rock he would build his church, he was referring either to himself as the rock, for God and no other is the rock of salvation, see Isaiah 44 and verse 8, or Christ was referring to the fact that it is the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, which is the rock of truth upon which the church will professedly be built. Peter himself, in his first epistle, refers to Christ as being the rock or chief corner stone on which the church is indeed built. See 1 Peter 2 and verses 4 to 8, which is the passage which I read at the beginning. And Peter never alluded to himself in the sense in which some have done so since. Like all of the apostles, Peter was a kind of a local pastor. That was also true of Paul. Peter wrote only two short epistles, and in the second one he refers to the superior wisdom given by God to Paul. See 2 Peter 3 in verses 15 to 16. We are built, it is true upon the foundation of truth which all the apostles and prophets have laid. But it is Jesus Christ himself who is the chief cornerstone, and neither Peter or Paul or any other can share that honour with him. See Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. When some of the early church fathers spoke of their sees as being Petrine, they were merely claiming to have some historic connection to the rock-like faith of the great apostle, at his best, that is, for he sometimes faltered, and they were not meaning to say that he was literally anything other than an ordinary apostle, if I might use that term in this connection. And in that sense, that rather elevated way of talking about Peter's rock-like faith and confession, a more moderate version of the Petrine doctrine would apply to Episcopal sees everywhere, to Carthage, to Ephesus, to Milan, to Marsilia or Marseille, as well as to Rome. It is very sad that so much weight has been put on a much distorted interpretation of what Christ said to Peter in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16 and verse 18. Hardly anyone in the churches of the early three centuries would have gone along with it, hence the need for the donation, the fraudulently claimed donation of Constantine, to bolster the Bishop of Rome's claim to universal power and authority. Nevertheless, what the fraudulent claims of the monopatriarch of the West, nev nevertheless, I beg pardon, whatever the fraudulent claims of the monopatriarch of the West, or the interpretations applied to him as world bishop, he did emerge as the focus of executive church authority in the West, not in the East. And on a pragmatic line, this seemed to serve a great need in an age of chaos and instability, to give focus and unity in and over the churches, and, do, and to do the same to a large degree for the barbarian kingdoms which had sprung up over the ruins of the Roman civilization. One can certainly understand and to a degree empathise with this development. How could anyone, including the great Alfred of Wessex, foresee that it might lead to further growths 
dangers and developments in and over both church and state, which would endanger not only the pure faith of Christ, but also the liberties of peoples, and the rights of governments and kings, and national governments and kings very often. That, however, with the tale of the great Mohammedan onslaught against the faith of Christ, must await a theme for another time. Amen. O Lord our God, almighty and eternal King, we give thee thanks and praise for the knowledge which you have seen fit to bestow upon thy servants of the health, the wealth, the power, corruption, the faith and the distortion of the faith of the church visible of yesteryear. We ask, O Lord, for grace and wisdom as we further study the history of the Church, to learn from its lessons, and to apply ourselves to thy true pattern of faith and practice, of belief and behaviour, as set forth in thy eternal word. Grant us, O Lord, never to be drawn forth into the mystery of iniquity, in which any one shall say that he is equal to Christ, and that as Christ the King's Viceroy, he exercises authority over the powers and peoples of the earth. And now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, rest upon us and abide with us now and for ever. For we ask all these things in the name and for the glory of that man who, being both God and man, in the unity of his person and in two natures, suffered and died for our sins. We ask it, O Lord, in his name. Amen.